Welcome back to Father and Son Fix. This episode is a follow-up to our first episode on how to hack your car with CAN bus super easy. From that episode, we got some feedback from you all that uh, you would like to see some more of the application. How does it work? And, and what does it look like sending and transmitting packets? So, here we are this episode. We're calling Theory and Application, You Can Do It. Our second episode on CAN bus, let's get started. Now when you get started programming CAN bus, it can be really intimidating because you don't want to make any changes that could damage your vehicle. And as we mentioned in the last video, you also want to be very safe. We were only working on CAN B in the last video, though that does interface with the other networks on the car, especially when you're working with the CAN C, the engine braking and telemetry CAN, you really don't want to mess around with that. You want to be sure about what you're doing. And so one of the great things about CAN bus is that you can actually work on CAN bus separate from the vehicle. And the reason why is the first part of this episode, theory. And we're going to talk a little bit about CAN bus and how it works. With the CAN bus system, it's not like your router at home and your computers at home where there's a central device managing the network or giving out addresses to each of the devices. Instead, on the CAN network, each device has its own ID and it's almost like a bunch of people all crowded in a room together. The person who shouts the loudest is the one who gets heard. Thankfully, priority is given to the IDs and, and typically you'll find that on the CAN C side, especially the safety and the breakings um, have the highest IDs. However, there's no central management point or a de uh, device in the computer which administers those IDs. Those IDs are hardwired into the CAN equipment itself. Uh, certainly there is a central interface point uh, which Mercedes uses for their star diagnostics and other manufacturers may use to access those CAN bus modules. But when it comes down to the module by module basis, each one is coded with its ID. It's not distributed. And the only hierarchy is in those list of IDs. What does that all mean in practice? Well, what that means in practice is that you can take a component from a vehicle and interact with it as you would if it were in the vehicle because there's no additional device or component that's necessary to talk to the CAN device. Each CAN device is its own node on the network. There's no parent or daughter nodes. They're all on the wire together. And so you can take one node or one device out of the vehicle bring it on the bench, and if you have 12 volt power, then you can talk to it on the bench. And that's really, for a lot of people, gonna be a better way to get into CAN bus hacking. You're not gonna worry about making changes to the vehicle, you're not gonna put yourself at risk, and it really uh, kind of frees you up to be more experimental and have more fun with it. You'll see a lot of people like to use instrument clusters because you can get a lot of um, interesting uh, inputs and outputs from that. Some people have done projects where they've set up a real world car instrument cluster to respond to the data coming out of a car racing game, which is pretty cool. Um, for our purposes, with the W211 Mercedes, we're gonna be working with this device here, which is known as the upper control panel. And this upper control panel device is something that has given some W211 owners, ourselves included, uh, some challenges. In particular, this device will not open or close unless it receives the associated command from the audio gateway unit which is in the vehicle. Now, what does that mean? Well, for those of you that don't have the W211, probably doesn't mean much. For those of you who have the W211, you may know that once the audio gateway is removed, if you put in an aftermarket audio system, or if you change uh, the main head unit, that audio gateway is no longer going to send the signal that allows this 
to open and close. So many people will find that once they've upgraded their stereo, either replacing uh, the main command unit or by replacing the AGW uh, amplifier in the back altogether, that they no longer have this functionality. And what we're going to show you is that that functionality is actually based on a CAN signal, which is being sent from the AGW, the audio gateway unit, to this upper control panel, which tells it that it's allowed to open. It's a little bit of a circuitous loop, but we'll show you that and we'll show you how you can work with CAN bus in practice on the bench away from the vehicle, which allows you to experiment and have fun. So let's dig right in. For those of you who saw the last episode, you may be wondering where is the CAN bed board? We've got the laptop, we've got the CAN device, we've got our 12 volt power source and here it is in the back with this oh, mess of wires as it turns out this component consists of the front control panel here with the buttons as well as the motor which is responsible for opening and closing this drawer which some people refer to as the hidden pocket behind it is typically where you would find uh, the CD changer if your W211 is equipped that way. So here we have our CAN bed board and this board is being powered through the USB right now and we've got it connected to the CAN high and CAN low that are coming out of the device. Now to determine which wires are the CAN high and CAN low for your device when you take it out of the vehicle it helps to see the plug on the other side and to be familiar with the color coding for those wires for your vehicle. So in this instance, the wires are white, and the way that we had to determine which was the CAN high and CAN low was to go back and look at the harness that this, original, that this device originally plugged into and then see where the CAN high and low wires went into that, and then from that determine which wires on the other side. It may vary by your vehicle, Something to note though, when you're taking the device out of the vehicle or if you're pulling it out of junkyard, take a photo or if you can, snip the entire harness so you get the color coding on the other side of those wires. Uh, so that'll help you identify what's the can high and the can low. So we've got the can high and the can low and these other wires are, have been uh, cut and put back together at various times from our experiments with this. You can ignore that. The, the main point is that we have the CAN bed here connected to the CAN high and the CAN low. Okay? So the first thing that we showed you last time was how you can read the signals coming from the vehicle. And we're going to show you that the CAN devices, even when they're not on the network, again, each node is independent, that they'll actually transmit a lot of CAN data as well. So what we're going to do here is we're We've got our receive script for the W211. And bear in mind, the baud rate that you choose for the CAN is going to have to match the vehicle. The, the device, when it's removed from the vehicle, is still looking for that same baud rate. So here we are. This is our receive script. We're going to validate it or verify it. Okay, no errors. Then we're gonna upload that to the board. Okay. Then the next thing, if you'll see here in this code, our outputs are gonna come through the serial monitor. So we're gonna open up the serial monitor. The first message we get is that CAN bus, okay, which means the script has loaded and we're clocked in at the right baud rate. Now, as we switch on this 12 volt power source, which is also connected here in not the greatest fashion, however, that's going into the positive and the minus wires on the device. So you're gonna to need to power your device with 12 volts of power. And we have this battery power pack that we've been using for testing for quite some time. And this is our little setup that we like to use 
You can even use a 12 volt AC DC adapter and go directly out of the mains or directly out of the wall electric. Um, you have to be careful about amperage there, uh, although it certainly is possible uh, to run a 12 volt AC DC adapter uh, to power your device. In the off chance that you have a vehicle that runs on a different voltage, like a Prius, um, you're gonna wanna verify your voltages, although most likely, if you're working with a CAN device, it's gonna be a 12 volt device. All right, so as we power on this upper control panel, you're gonna see all the different messages that come in through here. It is mind blowing the number of messages which occur only from one particular device. It is, it is amazing. This is in the, the span of time from turning it on. We have this many signals and, and they just keep coming in. As we mentioned, CAN bus is a lot like a bunch of people in a room shouting all at the same time. Uh, not the most orderly uh, means of communication. However, it's very fault resistant. So without a central node, each node being able to communicate on its own, separate nodes can be damaged or have issues and, and the other nodes can continue to communicate. Uh, so it's very robust in that sense. Now that we've pulled this data, it's a great time to answer one of the other questions that we had on the previous video, which is, well, how do you determine uh, which ID is doing what or you know how do you find out which button is transmitting which signal with all those devices in the vehicle at the same time it can be really noisy and there's a lot of different messages coming in at the same time however with a device separate on the bench it makes it a lot easier to see which button is triggering which signal and so for example we're going to press the unlock button and you'll get a chance to see what message that sends. Now it's interesting, we get a lot of repeated signals. So if we go back to the top, before we press the unlock button, we'll notice that we get a lot of the same signals uh, that we received. However, after we press the unlock button, we'll start to get a new signal that we didn't have before. Now you can also add filters to the code here to filter out certain IDs. And that's something that you can explore. It certainly can make it easy when you want to ignore a lot of IDs and zero in on one particular ID when you're working on the vehicle. For our case right now, we can parse the data visually to find, well, what's that new code that we didn't see in that first string of data? And here we have this new data, 40, 0, 0, 10, which doesn't appear anywhere in this top string of data. So we'll go back down here again, check your timestamp, and then we're gonna hit the unlock button again. And once again, if we go back to that timestamp, we're going to see that same code again. Now bear in mind this code already has been occurring. So that's some other transmission code. However, this new code by visually parsing, we can see that this is the code that has changed. Find it again here from pressing the unlock button. Now, what happens when we press the lock button? Okay, scroll back up. 
I'm going to ignore this data. Aha! And here's a new line of code that we have not seen before, which is 80, 0, 0, 10. Now let's take a closer look at the data that we pulled from the upper control panel. Here it is again, ID 2C 400010. Now before we go on to the next step, it's helpful to take another step back and look at the structure of a CAN bus message. As you can see, the CAN bus message is comprised of a number of different fields. The arbitration field, control field, data field, CRC field, and data at the end of the frame. For our purposes, we're gonna pay attention to the ID, which is the arbitration field, because as we mentioned, the ID arbitrates or determines the priority. We're gonna pay attention to the ID, and also pay attention to the data field. The other thing that's important to note is that the CAN bus message is in binary code. So to understand how to send a command, it's helpful to understand binary code. Now back at Arduino, the readout that we get in the serial monitor is not in binary code. It's in hexadecimal. So to bridge the gap between the two, it's helpful to have a hexadecimal binary conversion table. So when we go into this table and we look at the hexadecimal value of 40, we see that this byte is represented as 0, 1 with a set of trailing zeros. And for our lock command 80, it's 1 with a set of trailing zeros. Now, with binary code, the location of the bit that's flipped or turned on or off is described as the offset. So in the case of 40, we're offset by one bit. And in the case of 80, there's zero offset or no offset. Now, looking back at our code, we have 40, 0, 0, 10. And you can go on gathering the codes like this and you can develop um, your own list or a spreadsheet of different devices and messages, the CAN, associated CAN bus messages. Thankfully for the W211, there is a list of the CAN bus messages which has been retrieved by a Mercedes forum member, Alex Angelov. Thank you, Alex. And he retrieved this from Star Diagnostics. This list provides a fairly comprehensive, perhaps all of the CAN bus messages on CAN B, including the device IDs. So let's go and take a look at that real quick. And this will show us how the binary and the hexadecimal codes uh, relate to each other a little bit further. And we're also going to use that to find the code that we need to send to the upper control panel to tell it that it's allowed to open and close. So let's take a look at that list of IDs. Now, what we're gonna look for is ID 2C. And here we go. Let's do a search for it. Here it is. We've already got it called up here. And in this, we can see as we go down the list of commands, CAN bus messages from the upper control panel we see that there is unlock and lock. And if we look at the unlock code, it is described as offset one length one. As we go back to our hexadecimal binary conversion table, we see that 40 is offset one and it's one bit. Typically for a go, no go signal on a CAN bus, you're only going to have a one bit. And so if it's a more complex message, like an alphanumeric character, you may have uh, multiple bits. However, in this case, if we look again at the lock command, which is offset zero length one, back at the hexadecimal binary conversion table, 
we see again it is one bit length, zero offset to send that go, no go signal. So now that we've confirmed that and understand the relationship between the hexadecimal code that we're receiving here in our Arduino serial monitor and what that means in terms of the codes for the W211 here, next thing we're gonna do is look for the AGW commands and see what command we need to send to tell the upper control panel that it's okay to open and close. Now this is something communicating to the AGW, and this may actually be the speed which the AGW uses uh, for the volume control. Okay, here's the list of commands for the AGW itself. And if we look, we have here close allowed and opened allowed. And if we look back up top for the AGW or at the top of the AGW list here, we can see the ID for the AGW. So the upper control panel is 2C the AGW is 34. Let's keep that in mind. Now, these are the two commands. We want to tell the upper control panel that it's allowed to open and it's allowed to close. So it says offset three length one and offset two length one. So now we're going to go over and we're going to start to put together what that string is going to look like in terms of ones and zeros and then convert that back into the hexadecimal format that the Arduino will need to send the signal. So let's see here, close allowed is three, offset three, length one. So we're gonna go and let's start a new text document. Offset three, one, two, three, length one, one, and then we're gonna have a set of trailing zeros to make eight all together. One, two, three, four. Eight characters all together, okay? So that's our close allowed command. Now open allowed is offset two length one, okay? So offset one, two, length one, and then the rest trailing zeros and this is open allowed now as it turns out the CAN bus message can send both of these instructions at the same time in one message because there are different offsets and so the bit that is flipped is not overlapping so let's combine these messages together Now, this command from the AGW will tell the upper control panel that close and open are both allowed. So let's go look for this number or this binary string in the hexadecimal lookup table. Okay, here it is. The hexadecimal equivalent that we're looking for is 30. In addition to the hexadecimal value for understanding messages that you're reading through the serial monitor, you're also going to need to know the decimal value so that you can add this byte of information to the CAN bus message. So, Let's go back to Arduino and open up a sketch that allows us to send information to the upper control panel. So here's the sketch that sends a command over the CAN bus. And in this case, we're gonna send it directly to the upper control panel. This area here indicates the data content of the message. And so our first byte is gonna be in the decimal format of 48 and the remaining bytes will be empty. The message itself will be sent to ID 34, 
This information tells it the length, 8 bytes, standard CAN frame. And so let's uh, verify and then upload. Okay, we're uploaded to the board. And now, the moment of truth. Sorry, it's tipping over there, but as you can see, it opens and closes. We hope you enjoyed learning more about how to hack your car's CAN bus system, including some tips and tricks on what you'll need to know to work with the CAN bus board to receive and send signals. Most importantly, have fun, and if you can, work first with the device on the bench. It'll make it a lot easier and a lot more fun to get started, give you confidence to keep on going, Thanks for watching. We hope you have a great day.